Hey everybody, St. Paul here, and welcome to episode 60, 60 of Music on the Run. That's a huge milestone, and we're so glad that you've supported us all the way, and we were able to make it all the way here. None other than Grammy Award winner, and one of my heroes, Kenny Loggins. He's coming up on the next Music on the Run. Hey everybody, welcome to Music on the Run, episode 60. This is a huge milestone for us. And before we get going, I want to make sure that I thank a few people here. Number one, my patrons, uh, if it wasn't for you, wouldn't we wouldn't be able to do this show. You're the one who, ones who really make this work. Uh, these things cost money, so we appreciate you investing in this and our artistry and these great interviews we're able to get. So thank you to you. Of course, my producer, Davide Rosso, who's kind of egged me on for years to do this, uh, this podcast. Thank you so much, my buddy. And all the interns that we've had as well. They, they, uh, they have worked their butts off. We have had so much fun doing this. I also want to thank my guests. Um, there's been so many. I'm just going to name a couple on here. All the way back to the beginning with Steve Miller, Debbie Gibson, the Bacon Brothers, Sinbad, Victor Wooten, Donny Osmond, uh, Corey Wong. My own family, Andre Simone, um, Jason Chef, Kenny Aronoff, and the list goes on and on. Thank you for uh, trusting me with uh, your time. I appreciate it so much. And of course, I want to thank my listeners, you guys. It's been so much fun to bring this program to you for the last three years. No signs of stopping yet. So keep uh, supporting us, keep listening, and keep telling your friends about this podcast. Well, I can't think of a better guest to have on our 60th episode. Uh, he's really the reason I started running in the first place, and we'll get to that story later. He's an incredible songwriter, producer, musician, artist, author. He's got a pair of Grammys, uh, lots of humanitarian awards, songwriting awards, and I was lucky enough to be in this guy's band for a number of years. One of my musical heroes. Please welcome Mr. Kenny Loggins. Hey, hey. Kenny, how are you, my buddy? How you doing? I'm doing so yeah. good. Thanks for taking the time out to uh, to come on the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure. That's I don't know why it took us so long. I know. Well, because you're a busy guy, man. Yeah. You you've been. Uh, I see a book on your in uh, behind your right shoulder there. Yeah, that's where. You got to tell me a little bit about that. No, no, you're going to have to read it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, look, I'm actually, uh, I'm listening to it on tape while I'm driving my car. I'm about three CDs in. So I, I, actually, I think I'm up to the time you are meeting with uh, um, Messina. So that's where oh, wow. I'm, I'm entering. So I can't wait. It's so good. And I'm so glad you were the one reading it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been fun and challenging to do this. And, and every now and then a friend of mine will say, do you, do you think I should do that? I said, no, not if you lack any patience because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's laborious. It's uh, my, what I've been saying is it's a cross between a deposition and a therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Where were you suppose- on the night of December 12th? You know? Well, how, first of all, how do you, how do you even recall all this that? That was one Wait. of the reasons why I hesitated even beginning to do the project because so much of it is gone, you know. And I I'll bet. run into people all the time and say, "Hey, remember when we hung out at the such and such?" And I have no idea what they're talking about. Right? Yeah, man. Sure, of course I do. I think my hard drive filled up after about the sixty thousandth person that I'd met backstage. Oh yeah. <laughs> In all these years, you know, you meet so many people. So many things happen, and you know. So the good news is, so many great things have happened in my life. So I just try to distill it down to what I can get. I did interviews of old friends to see what they oh, were. Good. The the first drummer from Loggins and Messina, Merle Bugatti, and nice. a, a couple of the road managers and managers, and my lawyer and people. And what do you remember about this or that? And what what am I not allowed to talk about? And well, I was going to ask you, did you have to actually think about it and go, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to save? Uh, what do I want out there? Is that a conversation you had to have with yourself? Absolutely. But mostly, I, I, 
I really wanted that balancing act of, you know, the telling the whole truth, including two previous marriages. Uh, right. You know, what happened? What were those? How much of that do I need in the book and how much of that don't I need? You know, because yeah. uh, I'm in great relationships with both of my ex-wives. Um, You're lucky. And yeah, I know. I'm incredibly lucky. I don't want to keep it that way. So I don't, <laughs> you I want to screw want book, that up now. You know, I don't want a book to be, you know, telling things. So I sent them their chapters oh, before, good. I, before I actually came out with the book because I wanted to make sure that they were cool with it. And certain things Eva was great about, you know, you know, don't, she said, for example, don't tell people what you think I was feeling. Oh yeah. You know, just tell people what happened and leave my feelings to me. And, and I thought that was a great advice on all levels. Sure. I, you know, cause there's so many times we tell ourselves a story about something that happened. Like I can tell myself a lot of stories about Loggins and Messina, but it was all from the perspective of being 21 and 22 years old, right? I, you know, 23 sure. years old. And that's a, you're a different person when you're young and, you know, now looking back on it, was there a reason this happened? You know, what, what, what caused this or that to, to be the, what's in the memory? And um, so anyway, yeah, it was, it was part purging, you know, purging things that were difficult and primarily just trying to tell the truth yeah, and, and um, not burn any bridges while I did it. Right. And, uh, what, but, why, why now, Kenny? Well, you know, I'm 74. And I want to stop touring next year. Next year will be my final Are you year s- touring. Wait, time I haven't out. told anybody that. No kidding. Yeah. Okay, do tell. How come? Because you sound great. I mean, I'm, I'm creeping on you on the internet. Of course, I got to see how you're doing, how you're sounding, man. And you're blowing me away. So why? what is it that's making you think that you? it's time to hang it up? Um, I want to keep it. I want to keep it so that it's hard. It's hard to maintain the singing voice. I work on it five days a week. I have right, a, a vocal coach and I've completely changed the way I sing, not the sound of my singing, but the way I approach it, the, the technique of singing. I learned, I've been learning for the last year and a half, um, a system called bel canto, which mm. is a, a way of singing that where the voice comes out in a different fashion. And um, and it's brought my voice. When my highest note in 2020 was a G, and now I've got my highest note up to a C, which is for a full, for a full voice note. That's crazy. That is crazy I didn't for anybody, when I let alone crazy. a 74 year old guy. Yeah, and it's all from the system. And um, and because of that, I can keep touring. I don't I don't get as anxious as I was because in, from 2019 or 2018, even Shem could tell you. I would get very anxious about whether or not I would have the notes. And I had to take certain songs out of the show because they were too high. But then when Celebrate Me Home got too high, that was my final straw. I said, you know, I've got a trainer that works with me for pickleball, but I don't have a trainer. I've never had a trainer for my voice. And this is my primary way to make a living. So, yeah, I went into training and and now it's back. But to answer your question, I'm tired. I don't want to have to travel all the time. You know, I want to make sure that my investments are good and my future is solid. I've got five kids and lots of grandkids on the way. Do so you? I've had three so far and, and Cody's getting married this year. So that'll probably be a fourth or fifth. Oh, wow. You Congratulations. Know, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, a lot going on on that level. So so money needs, I need money. You know, when the kid comes to me and says, dad, I, I've got to get this, or I've got to get this procedure done or something like that. Yeah. I'd, got, I'd like to be able to help. Oh, sure. So that, I mean, touring has been the lifeblood for you forever. It's where you get your, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that where you get your joy be, besides that, obviously songwriting and things like that. But to but me, so- looking at you, it looks like you get your joy from that. It's a completely different thing than writing and recording. I love writing and recording too, because you get a, a raw idea for something and then you get to work on it until it actually manifests into a physical thing you can hold in your hand, play on, on your computer or whatever. But, um, but performing is really great. I love performing and you're right. I, I like having an audience reaction 
it's part of what feels like the culmination of all the work that we do to get up to that point. Mm. Um, but at the same time, the travel just will wear you down and the loneliness will wear you down. And I'm with a lady now who loves to travel with me and takes very okay. good care of me, so to speak. But um, um, I can't expect her to do that forever. And, yeah. you know, so I, I figure, and besides, I'm young enough now to get out there and travel for fun instead of yeah. traveling for a living. So maybe we'll go to Italy for a month or maybe we'll explore the world. So much of the world I have not seen because, as you know, when you go there on the road, you get to spend a day or two, maybe, before you move on to the next city or next country. So not not so much. I, it's completely different being a tourist. So, so you're saying that you're attempting a work-life balance at this point in your life. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's oh, my it. God. Yeah. That's uh, something I look forward to learning. Once you figure that out, will you let me know how that goes for I you? I think because you're doing a good job of it. I mean, the podcast itself is a way of having a home life. That's true, and I'm doing a lot more of that um, for sure. I'm not touring nearly as much, and that's been great because I've I've, I've gotten to see the things that uh, are important. My girls graduating from college. uh, Kelly got married. You don't know this yet, but she got married. Because your kids and my kids were pretty tight, um, the ones that are close to my age. So Yeah. um, In watching Taylor out in California, it's been a... uh, it's been a good journey for me, but, uh, you know, to look at someone like you, Kenny, who's been famous since he's 19, I'm sure that you didn't even have that in your vocabulary for 90% of your career. You mean, Is that right? You mean balance? <laughs> yeah, balance. Except I shouldn't say that because you are, you're a hippie, man. I mean, you are. I mean, I, I heard you say it yourself, so I, that's not a derogatory term by any means. I would give you more credit to maybe actually having more of a work-life balance, even though there, that terminology may not have been used. Do you think you had that during your whole career or not? I think I had much more balance in my second marriage with Julia. Um, okay. You know, that we really tried to, you know, have a real family where I would be present for that family. I took a whole year off when Luke was born. Uh, I've discovered actually that if musicians were to ask me, I would say, don't take the first year off, work your ass off the first year, because that's really mom and and baby time. And and that's where they're going to spend 90% of their attention is on their mama. Come in, maybe, you know, that that, that isn't to say leave town and never come home, but, you know, (laughs) establish your presence on some level, Mm -hmm. but really the time that that's required to be part of the family is at the very least from the second year on, I, I, for me, my experience is that I do better with little ones when they can throw a ball back to me. <laughs> you kick or throw. And port them at age five. I'm good with that, you know? Yeah. So I show yeah. up I show up around baseball time. Well, there you go. And he was a heck of a player, if I remember correctly. Luke was. Luke was a great player, yeah. Is he still, does he still, he old is, he's got to be in his, He's twenty nine. Twenty nine. Wow. Yeah, and he uh, he went from baseball to uh, culinary school. Did a year oh, and a half in right? culinary, and then he went off to UC Santa. Oh, come on, Kenny, uh, uh, Santa something <laughs> up north. We'll edit that Davis. part back in. Davis up north. UC Davis, Got it. and um, came out in sustainable agriculture. So oh, he likes to cool. call himself Farmer Luke, and then uh, beyond that, he's now at Pacifica getting a master's on um, on uh, depth psychology. So interesting wow. character. Boy, I guess. Yeah. Getting back to your retirement. Yeah, here, people want you... you to ask me questions about me, so <laughs> not my kids, or we could be. I know, but I uh, but we have some catching up to do, and that my 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 listeners know what this is about. Well, let me ask you this about your career. What what do you think you're gonna miss about performing other what's the biggest thing i should say that you're going to miss about performing it's the instant feedback you know to get up there work up an arrangement and then play it and have people respond to it that that instant feedback and of course the 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 reminiscing on footloose and danger zone and celebrate me home and this is it and you know to 
go back and play those songs and get that audience response again is that's a rush. And, you know, whether you criticize it or not, I mean, it's irrelevant. It, it's just a rush. It's fun. It's mm. part of why we do this. I think it was certainly at the beginning of why we did it. For sure. What, what are some of the things you're not going to miss? Well, as I said before, all the travel, the hotels, the, the loneliness, the yeah. things that caused me to make some of the bigger mistakes of my life. Um, just being alone out on the road and being a rock star is not necessarily conducive to health. That's a bad or, combination, or a bladder. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, um, you know, the pressure sometimes, the pressure to deliver a record or the pressure to show up for a particular event that the rehearsals, I'm not going to miss the rehearsals. <laughs> yes, you are. Come on. Gets, oh, no, I'm so sick of that. No, but uh, but I do love working ideas out, writing songs and working those ideas into reality. And I think I'm better at it now than I was ever because it's, yeah. it's an art, right? We, we practice our art. The more we practice it, the better we get at it. And then they put us out in the pasture. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, th that's an interesting concept. Now we could do a, a two hours on that one right there. Yeah, yeah, that's an it. Well, let's not. Let's because not. Because yeah. I want to. I want to uh, say one thing to you, and that is, when I was in your band, uh, and you were talking about arrangements and working things out like that, you taught me more without you know intentionally doing it, and probably every other band pr person who's been in your various bands for years than you'll ever know you taught us how to rehearse you are me meticulous and you are i mean i remember you being very um particular on uh even like how what what hand you wanted me to use what uh, what position you wanted me to use or the drummer if you want him to do a side stick or whatever the accent should be you hear these things that maybe, I mean, 99% of the other people in, in life will never hear. So you taught me how to be, you know, to get what you want that to make the music really move you. You also taught me and probably everybody else how to craft songs. And, 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 and it's, it's, that was a hell of an education, man. You, what is, why do you think it is that, uh, is it that you, you want that music to obviously, sound a certain way but it, it's got to move you right is that why you go through that right, right. i want it, especially the groove you know when you're working with the particulars of bass and drums you want that groove to be the right groove and many times i'll i work with a drummer now named dave salinas and many times i'll have dave take he he likes to do the one-handed hi-hat thing which most drummers do mm -hmm. but i'll have him do a two-handed hi-hat because the slinkiness of the groove changes right when you when you play the hi hat with two hands, and and it forces you to play your snare drum differently, and shifts the groove into more of an R and B thing. So I tend to, if I'm doing a song that has an R and B attitude, like heart to heart, like this is it, I'll probably lean more towards a two handed hi. -hat. Those are the things that I've learned over the years that make a difference. And Tris and Bowden taught me a lot of that. Oh, he's yeah, great, great drummer. One of my and was with me for I can't remember because I don't get along with time very well. <laughs> but but I think it was around a dozen years where we were together before he joined the, the band Chicago. And he would say, well, you know, you don't like that. Well, how about this? You know, mm -hmm. and it was that kind of give and take with with all my musicians. Nathan East, you know, was your predecessor in my band. Oh. Uh, he came one of my heroes, by the way. Who's oh, he's become a really of, good friend because of this podcast. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, he's 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 like one of the best ever, and I was lucky to get him in my band for a long period mm. of time. I can't even remember how I met him, but I was lucky to get him. And he invented the baseline for Footloose. And if, I cuss him out every time I see him for that. I said, "Do you realize <laughs> how hard that is to play that and sing that at the same time?" Well, what people don't realize, and bass, most bass players don't realize that that's a different baseline every chorus. Oh, I realized it because yeah. you pointed it out to me. <laughs> yeah. Everybody joins my band thinking, oh, this will be an easy gig. All this is is Footloose and Danger Zone. Hardly. Oh, baby. It's, it's, no. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot because I went through that, what they're calling yacht rock now, that sort of synthesis of smooth jazz meets hmm. RB meets pop, you know, that we were inventing this thing and we didn't really know that we were inventing a thing. We were just going where, you know, where our hearts told us to go, this 
this vibe, this feeling. You know, think about Mike McDonald. Michael's roots are <sighs> totally early Motown. Right. You know, uh, one of his songs, he quoted a Marvin Gaye song, or no, it was, a, it was Four Tops. Lyric, two, li- two lines of their lyric. And I said, Michael, did you, did you know this is directly from, you know, Four Tops thing? He said, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that his, his roots, his, that's where we were going to. That's what we were trying to do. Yeah. A song that we wrote like, um, maybe it's true what they say about it. Maybe mm-hmm. we can't make the ends meet. Um, uh, what's, what's the title of that song? I'll have to edit this. It's trying, to, trying to sing the chorus, right? <laughs> I know I got to try. I got to try. Thank you. And yeah. that was very much a, a Motown vibe for us. We were and trying you, to you wrote, I didn't know you wrote that, Kenny. Yeah. I didn't know you wrote that with you guys had a hell of a uh a run a, a run there. Well b- before we get to that run I was a fan of yours first of all before I joined your band because of your R&B approach but in, in listening to your book you really are more of a you you seem to come from more of a folk uh background where the hell did, did the the R&B slinky funkiness come from <laughs> um well that obviously was learned my my big brothers w- my oldest brother bob seven years older mm-hmm. was more into folk and and a little bit of country um and so i at, as a very early age i was exposed to that kind of music but my other brother was into all kinds of music including the whole limelighters folk kingston trio folk era but especially and that's Dan, Dan who, is, okay. who is four years older than me, Danny Song. And yeah. his, his influence ranged from uh, Little Richard and the Dominoes, uh, uh, Fats Domino, I mean, uh, the Platters, um, on and on through the early doo-wop period and into Elvis Presley and all the early rock. So you know, I was singing along with Buddy Holly when Buddy Holly was alive. Right. And... Uh, all that stuff influenced, you know, where I came from. But the early R and B, I guess you'd have to say. I, I know there'll be people arguing with that, but I'd go back to Little Richard. You know, Is that right? Well, he's, he's the inventor of, the, of rock and roll. He's the inventor of rock and roll, and he will gladly tell you that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, he did too. Yeah, yes. but I mean, think Bob Seger. Bob Seger wouldn't have existed without Little Richard. I mean, true. You know, that we just keep reinventing, we musicians just keep reinventing the rock and roll of our forefathers, if you will. Yeah. You know, Try to make it our own because we love it. We love it. And and it's also spawned hair bands in the 80s and, you know, all kinds of things that were, look at the, the cover of Mama Don't Dance by Poison, which was oh, yeah. basically a sort of punk hair cover of a folk rock band. <laughs> like, go right. figure, go right. figure. We're all borrowing from each other. Well, I, that's true. I did a deposition during that Garth Brooks story that I told, which you haven't got to yet. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, yeah. And, um, and in the deposition, I said, yeah, well, all musicians borrow from each other. And he said, the lawyer said, well, what, what do you mean? How do you define borrowing? And so I said, well, when I borrow an idea, I fully intend on giving it back. Ah, he didn't like that answer. I'm sure he did. Like, <laughs> oh boy, how am I going to recover from this one? <laughs> Let's switch gears for a second here because I'm watching the clock. I know you have another interview coming up. Yeah, um, I want to talk about. Okay, when I first got in the band, I thought it would be really smart to get to know you by showing up and meeting you where you were at. Meaning, you were into running. Mm. I was not, <laughs> and I'm like, I. I don't want to have anything to do with running, but I want to get to know this guy. And and so you said you were nice enough to invite me to go on a run with you. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. I'm dreading, 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 dreading. And then we went on a run. And of course, you smoked me. I have, was not a runner. And you were so far ahead of me. But we, I mean, you would continually ask me and we kind of developed a, a, a morning routine where you would call me, we'd go out, we'd go on a run. Um, 
that totally changed things for me. Really? I've been running ever since. My knee's trying to bug me a little bit this year, so I'm not having as much fun with that. But you are so instrumental in why I love running. Now, yeah. let me put this back on you. Tell me what your relationship was with running back in those days. Well, um, my big, <clears throat> excuse me, my big brother Bob was a runner and a long distance runner. And he died on the running track of a heart attack. No. Yeah, at 51. No. And so I, I, I thought, fuck running. I'm never going to run. You know, that's not a thing I want to do. He was also right. a hardcore vegetarian. Mm. Um, and then my second divorce started to come down. And the only way I could get out of pain was to run. And I found that within 30 minutes, something shifted in me that. I didn't know what to call it, but it's well known in, in running circles as the endorphins. When the endorphins mm -hmm. start to kick in, all of a sudden I could smell the sage around me. I could see the sky. I could see, mm -hmm. and I could think forward. I could start to think about what I wanted to do in the future, which I couldn't do while I was suffering in that self-indulgent part of the pain of, of a divorce. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I became hooked to that moment when I can bust through and hit the endorphins. And um, so I would run when I knew you, I would run at least five days a week. Um, oh yeah. I try to run almost every day. Unfortunately, I ran the fat pads off my feet and they yeah. actually moved forward under my toes. And, and I, I don't have the fat pads on my feet anymore. So I have to have a lot of padding in my shoes. No kidding. Yeah. I didn't know that was even possible. But I still have knees and I still have hips and I play a lot of pickleball. And that's, after you and I are done today, I'm going to go out and play another couple hours of pickleball. I got to try that. I have not tried pickleball it's yet. It's so fun, man. I know your listeners don't give a damn, but those of you they who do, are thinking actually, about they... pickleball, as, you know, what's this pickleball thing? Sorry about yeah. the name of the sport, but it's a great sport. <laughs> and it's, it's not set down on that board meeting go i got a great name for this it's <laughs> called pickleball yeah there's a lot of theories about why that is but anyway go let's go back to your question so i don't run anymore and i miss it yeah. because that endorphin thing is very difficult to achieve on a cycle i have to yeah. go about two hours on a bike before i hit endorphins anyway so there you go Be before we e exit the running conversation because this is called music on the run you, of course, you were way ahead of me uh, running. I mean, you would go do your thing and I would trail behind you on a daily basis because I, <laughs> I was just trying to keep up. But I remember, and forgive me if this is too personal and we can cut it out if it is, but I remember multiple times of you weeping while you were running, man, as if you were releasing something or the running released something. What was that? I always have meant to ask you that. That was probably the divorce. That was just waves of grief. Got it. You know, and the same thing happens. You know, my dog died a couple of years ago and there was a period of grief for that. You know, um, for sure. and I've learned through my experience uh, that that letting it move through me gets really really does release that it really gets you out of that jail when my dad died i didn't let myself get it and it took ah. me years i remember i was playing racquetball with steve wood and i missed a shot and i destroyed my racket on the wall <laughs> of, the, of the gym i literally just wailed on it and steve goes hmm <laughs> i think there's something <laughs> yeah. you need to look at <laughs> yeah a little anger management problem yeah, there. really and uh and he was right, you know, so hmm. the running for me was very cathartic in that way. Got it. But I see that. I didn't understand it then, but I really understand it now. And I, I look forward to getting back out there because I, I think that it not only, not only does it give you a second to be away from, I'm sure for you, but for me as well, the computer, the phone, the responsibilities, whatever the case may be, you just actually get to be in some time. I mean, I don't know about you, but my mind would, I can create, I can be free. I could, I come up with more stuff when I think I'm trying to clear my mind than I ever well, possibly when I, thought. When I started Blue Sky Writers, it was on a run. I'd gone to um, Nashville to write the divorce record. 
and was writing uh-huh. with a lot of different writers. I wrote with Gary Byrne. That's when I decided mm-hmm. I wanted to work with him. Mm-hmm. And I was running, listening to Lady Antebellum. And I thought, these guys would be great if they had great songs. Yeah. Said, Wait a minute, I can do that. So I called Gary and said, let's let's add a female and write great songs together. And everything we record should be written by all three of us. And we did that. We did it for six years. And it went right. really well. But, you know, there were reasons why very few people actually got to hear it. Um, because there, it was counterproductive to my solo career. But uh, dis- that's me. Distraction, putting that you think? Song. I'm sorry? Do you think that was a distraction to your solo career or do you think it enhanced it? Um, it was a distraction from my solo career, but my solo career was very difficult for me to move forward on, um, yeah. because I hit the, the music of the divorce and I couldn't write anymore. And so I, I felt that I'd hit that block and I thought the best way through this block is to, is to collaborate. And so with Gary, Gary and I wrote two divorce songs for that record together. Um, and, um, and I, and we laughed all the way through it. And I thought, shit, if I can be laughing while I'm writing a song about my pain, yeah, I want to work with this guy because this is this he's bringing that out in me. And uh, so can... we we worked together for six years. Georgia wrote a hit during that time. Georgia wrote a hit for Keith Urban. Georgia Middleman was in the band with us, right? And he ended up marrying Georgia. He said is nothing makes right? a, nothing makes a date go along better than asking her if she wants to be in a band with Kenny Loggins. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very Nashville story. You know? Oh my God. And so, yeah, we, uh, we wrote together as a trio and that in a way that helped the solo career because it unblocked me. I could, I could get back yeah. in touch with my writing in a positive way. You've always been really good at when you write to be able to separate a couple of different entities. And one is the pop entity when you're writing the, soundtrack stuff and then when you're writing conviction of the heart are they separate universes for you or can you compartmentalize them how do you deal with those i compartmentalized the soundtrack stuff because okay in that case you're being handed an emotional reality that exists on the film and you you put yourself in the position of that that actor of what that role is, what that story is, and you and and I try to enhance that. But when I write for my own stuff, it's much more autobiographical. Yeah. And um, Gary Bird, the guy I mentioned from Blue Sky Writers, he he hated admitting that his material was autobiographical. So he had on his business card, Gary Burr, I make shit up. <laughs> mostly because he'd be with he'd be dating someone and she'd say gee is that about me and he'd say no i make shit up <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. you know so that he could say whatever he wanted to say and not be held accountable but Jeez. you know uh, for me the the power is in the vulnerability to to get to where i'm saying the truth of what's happening in my life. And then more people relate to that because that's the truth in their lives. Boy, isn't that the truth? I think you said you just helped about 1 million people. If 1 million people listen to this thing, (laughs) you would get such sage advice through that being a hundred percent Kenny Loggins or whomever you are being true to yourself from the get go and right from your perspective. Yeah, don't is, be, don't be to I, share the truth. If, you know what you share about you is you sharing about all of us. Isn't it funny that the music business sometimes will talk you out of that? Absolutely, because they yeah. don't understand it. You know, the music Boy. business is bean counters. Oh yeah, they don't understand what really matters, what really sells, unless mm. they've done some work on themselves. Right. You have, um, you've got another year left before you're going to take this hiatus. Tell me a little bit about um, your tour. Who, who's playing with you briefly? And, and I think you've got some guys that I used to work with still in the band, which is kind of fun. Well, Scott Bernard is he's a guitar awesome. player. He's a great guitar player in Nashville. Dave Salinas, my drummer, originally from somewhere near London, um, okay. is a really interesting drummer. Um, the... Um, Rick Cowling that I mentioned was, yeah. he ran the most popular dance band in LA for years. 
Right. When he got replaced by DJs, he finally became available to join my band. And he's a great <laughs> singer, great yeah, he player. Is. He plays everything, he plays keyboards, he plays drums, he plays guitar. So, you know, in an emergency situation, he can pretty much sit in anywhere. Right. Um, I have um, Wade Beery on bass now. Wade Beery is was referred to me by a player who knew a player, and he's out of Alaska. Oh, wow. Very much the Alaska guy. He still tucks his shirts in. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and who am I forgetting? Oh, Carl Hergesell on keyboards. Oh, yeah. Carl, he's awesome. Out I of, love Out Carl. of Phoenix, Arizona. Great player. Yeah. Well, I just have to say thank you to you for your time. Man, it's so good to reconnect with you, first of all, as a friend. But it's so great to to see you doing so well and... Uh, and I wish you the best of luck uh, on your last year of touring. Hopefully, uh, we'll get to cr- our paths will cross uh, musically and, and in person again. And uh, you know, cheers to you, man! On a you job too. well done. You too. I'm I'm glad you're doing well, and thank you for the years of service, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, just being being there, being steady. It really requires the bass and drums. Require. Rock steady. Rock steady, baby. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, my, my buddy. We will see you soon. That's it for us. Episode 60 with none other than Kenny Loggins. We'll see you next time. Music on the Run was hosted by yours truly, St. Paul Peterson. Edited and produced by my buddy, Davide Razzo. Video editing by Emily Turner. And a very special thanks to the people who financially support this podcast. And remember, it's cool when your heroes are great people, too. Yeah.